for me, most notably in the expression of emotions <laughs> in animals and men, where no one since Darwin has analyzed the phenomena in as much depth as he did. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll give my, my favorite example, because this is, I think, after his prediction that the transitional human fossils would be found in Africa. This is my favorite bit of Darwiniana. And this is, he, um, in the expression of the emotions, he uh, introduced a principle of um, uh, what he called antithesis. That is, that when an animal uh, displays a particular intention with a particular conformation of muscles and, and joint postures, when it is in the opposite emotional state, it will display the opposite configuration or the opposite posture. And so he, note, he used this to explain uh, why dogs wag their tails, that when a dog is ready to attack, it will uh, lean forward, muscles rigid, tail pointed straight behind uh, in preparation to leap. What does a dog do when it's in a friendly frame of mind? It crouches down, has its head up, and its tail is limply wagging. Now, he asked, what's the uh, equivalent in the human case? Well, when a human assumes an uh, aggressive or angry posture, you have the shoulders squared, the brow lowered, the uh, head facing forward, the arms pronated, and the fists clenched. Now, what happens when you have the joint for joint, muscle for muscle, opposite of that. Well, you've got the head to the side, the brows raised, the shoulders uh, hunched, the arms supinated, and the hands open. <laughs> the evolution of the shrug. Now, no one since then has, uh, has done better at explaining why we shrug. And again, it makes the, uh, a prediction that the shrug should not just be a convention of uh, our particular universal culture, thing. but at least but found in other uh, cultures. And he, uh, he was amazingly eclectic in terms of his empirical methods, but any time a missionary or an explorer or a sailor was going to go overseas, he gave them a little questionnaire to fill out. Whenever you meet a, as he put it, a, a wild Malay or a Negro or a Hindu <coughs> or an Eskimo, could you write down uh, all of these features of what they do when they're happy, what they do when they're uh, angry, and so on, and got back uh, years later a set of diaries which allowed him to document the universality of many facial and bodily postures. Uh, an empirical body of, of research that basically lay uh, ignored for another century until Paul Ekman revived the study of universals of expression. But anyway, that's just my favorite example of the continuing relevance of, of uh, Darwin as a scientist. I think that uh, using the word God or, uh, or the attitude of faith toward that which you don't know is, uh, is a cop-out. It's a way of s slapping a label onto something uh, rather than trying to understand it. Or, since we may not, not understand everything, uh, just say there's some things we don't understand. Uh, to invent stories uh, that sound as if they were true or could be true, to pretend that they're true just so that we can have a story, I think is, is unsatisfying and it could even be immoral because it could lead you to uh, mistaken policies, to uh, getting in the way of your best understanding of how the world works, um, to doing things that could that lead to more harm than good. I mean, the concrete example would be treating uh, cancer with some cockamamie uh, herbal or homeopathic formula instead of the best medicine that we have. Uh, or justifying uh, <clears throat> invasions and murders and sacrifices on the grounds of uh, appeasing some god or carrying out some divine mandate. I think there's nothing but mischief that can come from inventing um, stories for uh, that which we don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying there's some things we don't understand. Yeah, there yes, most people have the uh, stereotype that science is about uh, inventing gadgets, curing diseases, monitoring the environment, a narrow uh, utilitarian focus on the material world, on, on uh, stuff and uh, bodies. But uh, science is much broader than that. It's really our uh, best attempt to understand uh, the world around us, including the world of other people, including the world of uh, politics and history and economics. I see science as 
first of all, be committed to the idea that the world is intelligible, that uh, there are explanations behind phenomena, and also that the search for those explanations is hard, that we are, uh, the human brain by itself is ill-equipped to figure out how the world works. We were, uh, our brains evolved to solve concrete problems like uh, finding out which plants are safe to eat or how best to tra trap an animal. They're not so good left to their own devices at figuring out uh, not only how the material world works, where life came from, but why wars start and stop, what drives the crime rate up, up and down, uh, what's uh, good or bad for the uh, economy or the environment or education. But that science can be applied to these problems and often it delivers surprises that uh, when you explicitly acknowledge that our own common sense is likely to be a source of error, that there are enough psychologists have characterized a number of bugs in our uh, cognitive software. Uh, by devising workarounds for those bugs, which I, is what I see science as being in the business of doing, you can often be uh, surprised at the state of the world and surprised at uh, what we can do to move the state of the world in directions. But in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, these brutal, sadistic forms of corporal punishment were abolished. They were abolished within a fairly narrow window centered in the second half of the 18th century. Here we have a timeline from 1650 to 1850 showing uh, a number of major states of the era that abolished uh, cruel ph physical punishments, including the United States with its famous prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Also abolished during this period was the profligate application of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. 18th century England had 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. The death penalty was not just on the law, in the law books, but was exuberantly applied. Uh, Samuel Johnson writes of a seven-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, the death penalty was prescribed and used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. Here we have a graph that extends from 1650 to the year 2000, showing the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder. In the colonial and early federal period, a majority of the executions were for non-lethal crimes. In recent years, the only crime other than murder that has been punished by death is conspiracy to commit murder. The death penalty itself, of course, has been abolished throughout the Western world, except in the United States. This timeline shows that uh, just about every European country has abolished capital punishment. Most of the abolitions took, have taken place in the last 60 years or so. But well before that, European countries lost their taste for executing people. The blue line shows the number of European countries that actually execute people, whether or not they have capital punishment on the books. And you can see that there's been a steady erosion of the application of the death penalty before it was, it was uh, stricken from the law books. Now, the United States is famously an outlier, or I should say that 34 of the 50 states are outliers because uh, 16 have abolished it, a number that uh, has increased by five in just the last decade. But even in the United States, the death penalty is a shadow of its former self. Here we have a graph from 1625 to 2000 showing the number of American executions per capita. The graph shows that the uh, execution rate has plunged. Uh, today, uh, for all its notoriety, the death penalty is applied uh, approximately 45 times a year in a country that has almost 17,000 homicides. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution, such as burning heretics at the stake, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and perhaps most famously, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth, as you can see in the number of uh, states that abolished uh, slavery in uh, 1600. But in a process that began in the second half of the 18th century, it was targeted for elimination uh, in country after country, a process that uh, reached its 
completion in 1980 when the last spot on earth, Mauritania, finally abolished slavery. And so for the first time in history, slavery is now illegal everywhere on earth. I don't believe there's such a thing as free will in the sense of a, uh, a ghost in the machine, uh, a spirit or soul that somehow reads the, the TV screen of the senses and pushes buttons and pulls levers of behavior. Uh, there's no sense that we can make uh, of that. Uh, I, I think we are, our behavior is the product of physical processes in the brain. On the other hand, when you have a brain that consists of 100 billion neurons connected by 100 trillion synapses, there is a vast amount of complexity that means that human choices will not be predictable in any simple way from the stimuli that have uh, impinged on it beforehand. We also know that that brain is set up so that there are at least two kinds of behavior. There's what happens when I shine a light in your eye and your, your iris contracts, or I hit your knee with a hammer and uh, your, your, your leg jerks upward. We also know that there's a part of the brain that does things like choose what to have for dinner, whether order chocolate or vanilla ice cream, uh, how to move the next chess piece, uh, whether to pick up the paper or put it down. Uh, that is very different from your iris closing when I shine a light in your, your eye. This, that second kind of behavior, one that engages vast amounts of the brain, particularly the frontal lobes, that incorporates an enormous amount of information in the causation of the behavior, that has some mental model of the world that can predict the consequences of possible behavior and select them on the basis of those consequences. All of those, th those things carve out the realm of behavior that we call free will, which it is useful to distinguish from brute involuntary reflexes, but which doesn't necessarily have to involve some mysterious soul. Melville, New York, hello. Hello, um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm reading a book, Life After Death, The Burden of Proof by Deepak Chopra. And I'm wondering, uh, one of the premises of the book, uh, The Burden of Proof, is, um, I guess, to prove the existence of a, a superior being, a mind, um, God. Um, and he does cite some examples um, in neuro, um, neurological research about uh, putting the mind before the brain or the brain, uh, as the brain as a controller of the mind. And I'm wondering... Uh, what do you think about uh, that, both of those philosophies? Mm -hmm. Well, the, uh, I, I don't believe that there is any uh, mind that's separate from the operation of the brain. So I think the studies that uh, look at people who, say, have near-death experiences and uh, have common accounts of what they experience as supposedly the soul leaves the body can all be explained in terms of the effects of oxygen deprivation on the brain, the kind of hallucinations that you have uh, when the visual cortex is deprived of uh, oxygen. And I don't think that any accounts of a person uh, ceasing brain function and then being revived and then being able to remember conversations that took place when there, there was no brain activity. I don't think any of those have uh, panned out. They all turn out to be uh, false reports, uh, cases where it would be very easy to reconstruct it after the fact. So um, I would have to disagree with the premise of the book. I haven't read it, but assuming that it's that mind can exist separately from brain, then I think the evidence is very strongly uh, against that. I mean, the mind can affect the brain in the sense that um, the whole operation of the entire brain, which is very densely and richly interconnected, can affect certain parts of the brain. The mind can affect the body in the sense that when I want my hand to, to raise, it, it does raise, uh, because mind in the sense of what my 100 billion neurons are doing can affect the body because the brain is connected to the spinal cord, which is connected to the hand. So I don't think that mind and brain are, or mind and body are separate in the sense of not being able to interact. But I don't think there's anything called mind that somehow floats free of the, uh, of the brain. Card. What about violence committed or religiously sanctioned violence and religiously sanctified violence? For example, Islam, if you kill under Islam, if you kill an infidel, you're guaranteed a place in paradise. 
take the Catholic Church, do, it sanctified the Spanish Inquisition, mm -hmm. sanctified burning at the stakes, and then auto da fe. Of course, they are given up that now. Maybe better angels worked miracles in the case of Catholic religion. Islam still practices, they have not reformed it. So you have, have you thought about it during your research? <laughs> no, I, 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 actually I, uh, I have, and indeed, uh, militant religions, like other militant ideologies, that, uh, that denigrate the value of an in the life of an individual man, woman, or child, I think are among the most pernicious destructive forces. And the general secularization of the world since the time of the Enlightenment, I believe, is one of the forces that has uh, helped reduce violence in, in many parts of the world. Institutionalized forms of violence, like the Inquisition, the Crusades, the wars of religion, that some of the remaining threats do come from idea, religious ideologies that still glorify the, the creed, the faith, the religion over the uh, lives on earth of individual men, women, and children. Then you might have a situation where no one actually believes something, but everyone believes that everyone else believes it. And therefore, no one is willing to be the little boy that says the emperor uh, is naked. Free speech is important everywhere, but particularly on college campuses. That's because they're an institution in which ideas are developed, presented, debated, evaluated outside the walls of the university. There are constitutional protections for saying things that, that might be wrong or that might be offensive. It's the university that imposes more stringent uh, restraints on speech than society at large. We're in a really sad state of affairs if it's the lawyers that have to tell the professors and university administrators what they can and can't say. In order that uh, ideas be brought to light and evaluated, including ideas that we may all believe that may be wrong, it's, it's happened in history <laughs> many times, uh, it's essential that there be a space in which those ideas can be stated explicitly and uh, evaluated. In fact, one uh, answer to the mystery of why societies often fall under the spell of a collective delusion such as the European witch hunts, which, which uh, tortured to death 150,000 women on, who were suspected of causing ships to sink and crops to fail by casting spells, or pogroms against Jews who were accused of, of uh, killing Christian boys to use their blood to make matzah, not to mention the horrors of Stalinist uh, Soviet Union or uh, Hitler's Germany. Uh, you look at them retrospectively and you say, how could everyone have been so mad? Uh, on top of being evil, these ideas seem patently ludicrous. How can you have a collective delusion overtaking an entire society? And it looks like one of the answers is if dissenters are punished and can anticipate they're going to be punished, then you might have a situation where no one actually believes something, but everyone believes that everyone else believes it. And therefore, <laughs> no one is willing to be the little boy that says the emperor uh, is naked. Uh, and this pluralistic ignorance, as it's sometimes called, uh, is easily implemented when you have the, uh, the uh, punishing or censoring of unpopular views. Well, taboo itself uh, is an interesting psychological topic. Why are certain thoughts uh, sinful to think, uh, given that they harm no one? And uh, there's a, a theory that comes from the psychologist Philip Tetlock that uh, it, the psychology of taboo comes from the need to protect certain sacred relationships that we have. Uh, if I were to ask you how much, how much money would you accept to uh, sell your child uh, or as an indecent proposal for your uh, wife or fiance to have sex uh, with another man, you know, what's it worth to you? The usual response is not, um, well, you know, what are you offering? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, maybe I can do better. It's, uh, it's I'm outraged even to uh, contemplate that indecent proposal. So in our intimate relationships, there is a certain logic to keeping certain thoughts just out of bounds. Just don't go there. That's the kind of relationship we have. That's the kind of person I am. That's the esteem with which I hold you. It just becomes uh, maladaptive when you apply the logic of intimate relationships to the sphere of ideas, where by entertaining a particular idea, you're basically betraying your solidarity with the tribe. Uh, tri as with families, as with couples, 
Coalitions of people, probably originating from our tribal psychology, are held together by shared beliefs that one uh, dare not question, in particular betrayal of, of the group. That's a bit of our psychology that may have made some sense in a, a Hobbesian world of tribe against tribe. But when the coalitions are political parties or schools of thought or scientific theories, the psychology of taboo can really get in the way of finding the truth or of figuring out the best way to run our affairs. Well, the doctrine of political correctness uh, was a reaction to some genuinely upsetting developments, uh, pseudoscientific theories of racial inferiority, the um, uh, oppression of women, and in, uh, as a backlash to those views, uh, many intellectuals in the 20th century embraced the idea that the mind is a blank slate. Uh, that is, that we are born with no talents or temperaments, everything is inscribed by parents and culture and society. And that was an appealing idea because it meant if there's nothing in the mind at birth, that means that differences between uh, the races are impossible. Differences between men and women are impossible because there's nothing there on the slate to begin with. Differences between uh, among individuals within a society that might lead some to become rich and some to become poor, those were impossible in principle. So it seemed like an appealing idea. Now it's an idea that is uh, certainly false uh, in its extreme case. Blank slates don't do anything. You could not possibly have uh, an intelligent species like a human being that was just born as a, as a lump of putty, to, to change the metaphor. And since uh, we differ genetically, that's just the, the stuff of life is genetic variation, it's almost certain that we are not all biologically indistinguishable. So does that mean we have to go back to the old days where uh, women uh, had to stay in the, in the kitchen with the children and that uh, races were arranged along a hierarchy? No, of course not, because those ideas are, are also uh, absurd for a number of reasons. One of them is that even when group differences exist, they always consist of overlapping distributions, two overlapping bell curves, and so you know uh, very little about an individual just by knowing what sex or race or ethnic group he or she belongs to. It's, uh, you always get much more information by assessing the traits of that guy or that woman. We can still be completely fair, non-racist, non-sexist, uh, make no invidious distinctions, even as we acknowledge the plain truth that not all of us are uh, interchangeable with uh, one another. You wonder why the, uh, the data that I've presented in Better Angels of Our Nature, namely that violence has declined on so many scales of time and magnitude, could be seen as itself a uh, politically incorrect claim. Um, you think, gee, well, it shows that our efforts to make the world a better place have succeeded. It's a, a, a kind of an empowerment of progressive causes, like the reduction of racism and sexism that is behind the decline of lynching and racial pogroms and rape and domestic violence. So you think that, that especially progressives should celebrate this, but uh, often the reaction is more one of, of uh, anger uh, and denial. And I think it's because the, the fear is that if um, if you say that things are, have gotten better, then maybe you'll kind of take the heat off. Maybe people will say, well, we're living in a, a good society after all. Uh, we can relax our, our uh, efforts to drive violence down, uh, which I think is exactly wrong. I think, in fact, if people are become fatalistic, they think, well, what's the point of trying to make the world a better place? People will screw it up no matter what you do. That's the uh, license for complacency introduced a principle of um, uh, what he called antithesis. That is that when an animal uh, displays a particular intention with a particular conformation of muscles and, and joint postures, when it is in the opposite emotional state, it will display the opposite configuration or the opposite posture. And so he, note, he used this to explain uh, why dogs wag their tails. That when a dog is ready to attack, it will uh, Now, what happens when you have the joint for joint, muscle for muscle opposite of that? Well, you've got the head to the side, the brows raised, the shoulders uh, hunched, the arms supinated, and the hands open. <laughs> the evolution of the shrug. 
Now, no one since then has, uh, has done better at explaining why we shrug. And again, it makes the uh, prediction that the shrug should not just be a convention of uh, our particular universe. for me, most notably in the expression of emotions in animals and men, where no one since Darwin has analyzed the phenomena in as much depth as he did. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'll give my, my favorite example, because this is, I think, after his prediction that the transitional human fossils would be found in Africa. This is my favorite bit of Darwiniana. And this is, he, um, in the expression of the emotions, he, uh, Lean forward, muscles rigid, tail pointed straight behind uh, in preparation to leap. What does a dog do when it's in a friendly frame of mind? It crouches down, has its head up, and its tail is limply wagging. Now, you ask what's the uh, equivalent in the human case? Well, when a human assumes an uh, aggressive or angry posture, you have the shoulders squared, the brow lowered, the uh, head facing forward, the arms pronated and the fists clenched. So culture, but at least, but found in other uh, cultures. And he, uh, he was amazingly eclectic in terms of his empirical methods. But any time a missionary or an explorer or a sailor was going to go overseas, he gave them a little questionnaire to fill out. Whenever you meet a, as he put it, a, a wild Malay or a Negro or a Hindu <coughs> or an Eskimo, could you write down? Uh, all of these features of what they do when they're happy, what they do when they're uh, angry. 